and welcome back to Elven Plot Armor, and we're back today to wrap up our series on the non-legendary High Elf Lords. So far we've run through the Prince, up to the Princess, and now we're wrapping up today with the number one choice of the Archmage. So when we're ranking the Lords, what are we using for our criteria? Well, certain Lords will be better at early levels, others will be better at late levels. Now, as the campaign goes on, we can recruit at higher levels, so we need to consider which is going to be a good Lord from the beginning all the way to the end. Do they buff units that are good only in the early game, or are they able to have some synergies with strong high-end units? Now on that note, also if they boost units, are those units easy to come by? Are they held behind a really awkward and contrived building that's not really convenient and good for your overall campaign to build? And last of all, their overall strength and versatility. Now, what is it that makes the Archmage so strong? Well, overall, it's because of their Dragon Mount. I mean, magic is very, very strong, but something that makes a unit overwhelmingly strong is when you can get an upgrade for it, which completely circumvents all of its shortcomings. The Prince and Princess get better on a dragon, but this unit gets an incredibly good. She can fly around, dumping spells where she wants, and is generally impervious to most types of uh, enemy unit and army composition that you're likely to come across in your campaigns. There are several laws of magic to choose from, and each can have its own tactical advantages over the other. There are some standouts, and I'm not going to just lie and say that they're all equal for you. Maybe they are, but in terms of high elves, they definitely have their synergies that do help. If the Dragon Mount wasn't enough to circumvent the shortcomings of the Archmage, she can also usually be hired with one of several traits which will be able to buff that original lacking. Uh, melee attack, melee defense, and even charge bonus. This makes her obviously much more suitable for cycle charging if she needs to do it. So in between casting, breathing fire, she does, if it does need to come down to try and really rock the unit off the field, she can do that and this will help her do it better. Again, filling in her weaknesses. Now, for her genuine weaknesses, of course, she is very, very squishy and very, very soft and lackluster at low levels. Unless you can probably hire off the bat at maybe level 7, you're going to be for, there for an uphill battle and in that time period you might get better mileage from a prince or a princess. But there will come a time, you can hire at a high enough level and there will be no dramas and this is usually a pretty safe pick to have. The other con that there is for Archmages is that they sometimes struggle in the way that you level them up. You want Lightning Strike, especially if you're playing on Legendary, you want Lightning Strike. It will save you so many times, it's not worth losing your army or in this case having your Lord die. So. Uh, Lightning Strike can then be a bit of a difficult thing to choose between that and maybe say Net of Amantok if you're a Light Mage. So there's that low level progression. So if you can get your Lord at level 10 or 11, you can get Lightning Strike and then one of the first level spells. Now to circumvent all the weaknesses of the High Elf Arc Mage, we have these traits. The most famous of which is Incendiary. They have nerfed it and it is still freaking good. Uh, Incendiary will typically increase the, well typically it always does, it increases the charge, melee attack and melee defense. So as doubling the damage and giving flaming attacks, this synergizes is great if you are running as Imric. Uh, protected and Limbo will make your uh, dragon mage more survivable, very very good. So anything that basically uh, increases melee defense means you've got more staying power, anything that uh, reduces missile damage, that is also a good thing because you will have run a dragon. Now, Trace to Avoid, you can get Administrator as well as Entrepreneur on Heroes instead of your Archmages. Now, there's no reason really to actually have them on here. You have better off making a Beat Stick, in my opinion, in my playthrough, is to make a Beat Stick Archmage rather than these other traits which are cheaper in terms of influence and in the case of Entrepreneur, even better on a hero. Laws of Magic. There's some typical things that seem to be agreed upon on the internet and the general masses and I agree with these, so I will share these. Um, light. Fantastic for arches, it pins units still, which is great for high elves, because their strength is arches. Now that we've gone through the traits and the laws of magic, we're now going to go through some of the most popular builds. And these are builds that a lot of people have maybe written about online. Uh, typically though, we focus on traits as well as army composition. For the arc mages, the trait is nowhere near as important, because their power comes from the law of magic and their dragon mount. But just keep in mind, I like to focus on ones which decide to increase the survivability, of the Archmage as opposed to other more gimmicky things. So let's jump into our first of my favourite top three high elf Archmage builds. Now before we jump into the top three, I just want to quickly touch on an honourable mention which is the Fire Archmage. Now you might ask why would this not make the top three? And the reason being is that Fire Mages, when taken as a regular hero, get access to the Sun Dragon Mount. Other heroes that are mages do not. It makes more sense and 
This is an incredibly powerful build. For even as a hero, this is a one-man army. So why not have that, as well as a Lord of Magic with another dragon riding Archmage, and they will support each other that way. This, in my opinion, is by far the best way to get Fire Magic onto the field. You can support your army with Lore Masters to bring healing spells for life, but for fire support, bring a regular mage and get her on dragon at level 22. You will not regret it. It absolutely beats them down. The only time where I would bring a fire mage is when you have potentially a settlement that's going to get invaded and there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. But you hire one arc mage. Of fire, doesn't even matter, but you can do this burning arc mage. But for example, Skaven, goblins, they get wrecked by fire magic. So just hire this young lady here, put her in there, and get her to lead that garrison, and she will do so much damage and make it so much worth your time. You will slow down and really hinder that force, and that will stop them from snowballing through your settlement. So really recommend it. They have a use, but they're a short term stop because fire magic is better, in my opinion, without a doubt, on a hero mage. Kicking off with our number 3 spot, we have the Archmage of the Heavens. This is a very, very, very flexible school of magic. It's good in the early game, good in the late game. It has great spells, great debuffs, great ways of keeping your army in the fight and turning it when it's unfavorable. The reason why this Lore of Magic is getting this number 3 spot is because it's great at dealing damage and it is so flexible. You do not need to have a certain army that this Lord needs to accompany to be able to get the maximum value out of it. This will give the beat down on just about anything you come across and elevate anyone that you are accompanying with it. So for that reason it gets the number 3 spot. Now there's some fantastic spells here. It's up to you to decide whether you don't want to go for Lightning Strike first. I always do. I think it's always worth doing it. Once you have that, you, as I said, you can get maybe you see two armies that you know you can beat, beating them both individually. You'll get twice the experience. So in that way, Lightning Strike can pay for itself. So just consider that when you go for your spells first. But regardless of that, you of course want to get Thunderbolt, Chain Lightning, Comet. These are all fantastic spells, but keep in mind that one con of this School of Magic is it does require some execution. It's nowhere near as point and click friendly as Fire, and that does need to be considered. Now, again, like I said, you can put any units you want with this School of Magic, and it will pay off. Of course, you eventually want to get yourself up to the Dragon Mounts. Now, moving on to the number two favorite build of mine for the High Elf Archmage. Coming in at the number 2 slot, we have the Dragon Lifebringer, i.e. a dragon stack with an accompanying life mage. This is a, pretty much a doom stack support and it works very well. The uh, spells regrowth are incredible for being able to keep your dragons in the fight for longer, and that is what she's there to do. She has great survivability when you pair it with the correct traits, and if you put her with your right, right equipment, she can actually do a fair bit of cycle charging and support that way too. The difficulty, of course, is going for Lightning Strike first. You, of course, you'll be able to make do quite well with it, like better than some people would probably make out, but you want to get to Regrowth, which is all the way down at the other end of the tree. And of course, you want to get Earthing because overcasting Regrowth is great. Earthing is good to get if you overcast spells. Fire, you don't really need to overcast, but this Lord of Magic, you definitely do if you're going to be bringing the Dragon Stack. Now, Arcane Conduit, fantastic to go for, then of course all of the stats across the top will help your Dragon Mage stay in the fight for longer. Um, the Moon Dragon covers the weaknesses that she has, as usual, and as always, you basically have to uh, deal with being low level for longer, but when you get on this mount, all your problems are gone. So there's nothing else to really say about it. Dragons are powerful, she helps get there, but the fact dragons are slower and harder to recruit from tier 5 buildings is the reason why this only got the number 2 spot on the list. And now coming in at the number 1 spot is the Sisters Light Mage. This should come to no surprise to anyone who's seen how powerful the net of Amatok is. It is incredible at holding and pinning units down and being able to keep them still and let your archers just dissolve them. In addition to Net of Amantok, Banishment is an incredible vortex spell that has great crowd control potential. Again, when you're flying on a dragon, you can go around dropping this wherever you want from the relative safety of the sky, and then you add this into the fact that you can basically drop vortexes, breathe, fire, pin down units, and have your archers just delete those big threats. You've got yourself a top tier spell and a top tier caster who can support her army to the advanced degree. Now, why did she get number one spot over dragons? Well, dragons are tier five. This is about along which are arguably their best unit, are only tier four. This also still synergizes with regular archers, right? So you don't 
you, you can't really make use of dragons until you're tier 4 anyway, whilst if you did so much really want to decide to level this lady up, then you can get her and she'll still have some potency there. Now the difficulty is that the net of Amatov does delay getting lightning strike if you want to go that way, but you can really really choose which way you want to run this build and that is why, without a doubt, this is the strongest way to go. Again, if you want fire in your army, run this mage with the archer heavy build and then have a sun dragon with a fire mage uh, riding it, just a regular hero, you've got all your bases covered. I can't insist enough how powerful this is. If you're having trouble even on Legendary, this will be able to hang with any type of army, especially Chaos. Now, of course, when you get your Arc Mage, the priority can change from person to person, but I, don't know, I tend to play on Legendary, I always play on Legendary, so I really can't justify not bringing. Three points in Wary for Ambush Defense, and that's great against Gaven, of course, and then Lightning Strike, which is great against everything else. This allows you to turn two engagement, one engagement into two engagements sometimes, which means more experience, right? It'll pay for itself in the long run. Um, you, of course, then your priority, let's say this is your Light Mage, of course, so we want, of course, a net of Amantok. Some people would like to put points in here, but I just do not see it as worth it because you can get much more potential out of your mage by continuing down this tree. So I myself would always put two points in that Abandon because it's fantastic when overcasted. As well as I like to always put one point in the passive. Every single Lord of Magic has a passive, meaning this enables every time you cast a spell. This was a bit of a sub passive effect that will occur. So I, I can't just define not putting a point in it, so, and one point in fast protection to give yourself the ability to buff your melee uh, defense and armor. And then going into the big heavyweight spells, most laws of magic have a big damage control spell. It's usually worth putting a point into it, they very rarely disappoint, by and large. And then magical reserves. Uh, I, this unit was only uh, level 16, but from here, I simply would max out banishment, put a point in everything. If you're going to give up overcasting, you want to reduce your miscast chance, and then put a point into Greater Arcane Conduit. From there, you want every single one of these. Just this whole line from the Moon Dragon across, you want to be able to get your ward save, your speed, and melee defense, and uh, two free casts of Chain Lightning, absolute control, and then immortality, of course goes without saying. And then from there, the world is your oyster. You can choose to, if you really want to buff your other dragons, or if you're a life mage, or archers, you can. It's useful any time, no matter how little or how much pressure you're under. So, in conclusion, you might find that you have trouble hiring non-legendary lords because it's so easy to confederate with high elves, but you will have times where you do it, and if you invest in these lords, helping them survive, you will really, really have yourself covered on all bases and be able to handle a chaos invasion and anything else the enemy throws at you. My name's Ryder, this has been Elven Plot Armor, and thank you so much for sticking around. Um, I'll be doing more series and I'll be going through the Legendary Lords, so please feel free to give us a like and subscribe if you have enjoyed this, and there will be more content coming out, and I uh, really look forward to sharing with you. Thanks guys, peace out.